Hey, what's up everybody? Today we're going to be talking about a subject that is near and dear to my pituitary and kidneys, hyponatremia. Hyponatremia, why are we talking about hyponatremia? Well, this is the most common electrolyte abnormality that you will, occur, uh, that you will note in the hospital, and it is defined as a sodium of less than 135. So, how are you going to know to do a BMP on your patient and find a sodium of less than 135? Well, the symptoms of hyponatremia are related to the fact that when sodium is low inside the blood vessel, this is a blood vessel, clearly, then this becomes hypotonic and this becomes hypertonic. This, of course, is a brain, cerebrum, cerebellum, brainstem, and so water moves from the blood vessel into the brain cells, causing swelling. Swelling results in symptoms of nausea, confusion, headache, lethargy, seizure, coma, and death. Not exactly in that order, but hopefully the death is not until much later than the nausea, all right? So your patient may have any of these symptoms, um, and you run the BMP, the sodium is less than 135. Now, I'm going to draw your attention to this over and over again, but hyponatremia is not a salt problem. It is a water problem, and we'll come back to why, but it's related basically to the fact that there's too much water, not enough salt. Now, the first step to working up a hyponatremia is to check the serum osmolality, and I will use the term osmolality and osmolarity interchangeably. I know that one of them is by mass and one of those by volume. Sorry, you sticklers, but I don't really care. So, um, just remember, osmolality is basically primarily determined by sodium, and when we talk about osmolality, we're talking about um, substances that cause the movement of water. And so sodium is the main determinant of that in the blood. So 2 times the sodium plus glucose over 18 plus BUN divided by 208 is going to give you the approximate osmolality. And uh, so an approximation of the approximation would be to take double the sodium plus 10 in normal circumstances. Now, when we're working with hyponatremia, we don't do this calculation. We measure the osmolality in the lab, which measures these three things and all the other stuff that causes water to be pulled down. And so what we get after we check the osmolality in the lab is either normal, 280 to 295, hypoosmolar, less than 280, or hyperosmolar, greater than 295. All right. Hypoosmolar hyponatremia is the only true hyponatremia. That's why it's in this nice green box here. This is the only real one. This is the only one that's going to cause symptoms. All right. So what is going on with these other two? Well, isoosmolar hyponatremia is also referred to as pseudohyponatremia. And this is an old lab artifact. Uh, for the most part, labs today won't even, you won't even account. You won't even have this problem because labs measure sodium in different and more accurate mechanisms that I'm not going to go into <laughs> because I don't really know what they are. Um, but here is what we're talking about with isoosmolar hyponatremia just because you're all dying to know how this happens is this is a test tube. These are lipids here. The P's down here stand for protein and then sodium is right here in the middle and so what happens is when you get really high levels of triglyceride lipids or protein in the serum then that would that used to obscure the measurement of sodium and so the sodium would hide behind these lipids and proteins in the test tube and result in a artificially low measurement of sodium um, but the sodium was actually normal and so the osmolality was actually normal uh, and uh, so, you know, for example, this would be in people with multiple myeloma or people with muscular uh, my myasthenia gravis who are being treated with IVIG. People who just ate five hamburgers before they came in to have their cholesterol drawn. Um, and uh, so the base basically the take-home being this is an old lab artifact. Don't worry about seeing it anymore. All right. So let's move on from isoosmolar to hyperosmolar hyponatremia. Now this you may actually encounter right? and uh, most of the time people know that about this phenomenon and so you won't measure the osmolality but you may occasionally see this uh, in your practice. Um, the concept here 
is here's another one of our nice blood vessels and there's some sodium here but then there's all these purple things and so these purple hexagons re uh, represent carbohydrates either mannitol or glucose and so what happens is when glucose is very high inside the blood vessel then glucose remember glucose is also an osmolite uh, osmolarly active particle and uh, so glucose can pull water Glucose can pull water into the blood vessel, diluting out the sodium. Um, mannitol, also, um, when we're treating people for elevated intracranial pressure, uh, giving them mannitol, this can happen too. Um, and so the blood vessel in that case becomes hypertonic, and so water moves into the hypertonic environment, diluting out the sodium. So, again, sodium is normal here. Um, it's just a, a sort of a, a measurement phenomenon. And so what you can do is correct the sodium when you see that the blood glucose is high. Now there are lots of formulas to do this. Some people just like to take the blood glucose and divide it by 60. Um, I uh, was informed by my readings, of course I don't really have any experience in this, but I was informed by my readings that the most accurate way is to take, focus, take the sodium uh, plus 2.4 for each 100 mill milligram per deciliter rise in blood glucose. What? Alright, so here's an example. Sodium is 130, blood glucose is 350. So we say 130 plus 200, 300, 350. Oh, okay, 136. Now, if this seems needlessly complicated to you with carrying the ones and using decimal places, you can also get an app to do it, or like I said, there's other formulas that you can find online. So just remember to do this, and remember that this phenomenon exists, and you'll be fine. And so the treatment, treatment is always pink, is to uh, correct glucose, all right? And then your sodium will also normalize. Hmm. All right, so we knocked out isoosmolar, we knocked out hyperosmolar. We're doing great. Now let's take a look at hypoosmolar, hyponatremia. All right, this is a, as I mentioned, true hyponatremia. And so the next step to, uh, to determine what you're going to do with this is to assess the patient's volume status. All right, assess volume status. Now I'm going to spend a little bit of time on this because uh, this is tricky and uh, it's also very important for your sort of your diagnostic tree here. Um, so... Uh, Assessing volume status is uh, something that even experienced clinicians have difficulty with, and uh, I'm a medical student, of course, so I have lots of difficulty with this. But uh, here are some things to help you. Vitals, if the patient has low blood pressure and a high heart rate. Orthostatics, uh, defined as rise of 20 millimeters mercury systolic and 10 millimeters mercury diastolic when the patient goes from lying for two minutes to setting up, blah, 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 blah. Or the pulse rises by 10 they're orthostatic, okay? Their heart rate rises, their blood pressure drops when they stand. Um, that's a sign of volume depletion. JVD, of course, uh, hypervolemia. This is an interesting one. Axillary moisture. All right, this is from a series of uh, article uh, in Journal of American Medicine, the Medical Association, JAMA, uh, called the Rational Clinical Examination. Um, they did uh, an article on assessing volume status, and what they uh, found was that the best determinant is the axillary moisture, not of yourself, that is always increased when you're a medical student, but of the patient. And so if the, this is absent, this is a great physical exam sign for hypovolemia. So uh, start feeling your patient's armpits. Uh, you won't regret it. Um, now also the uh, an S4, okay, that can be a sign of uh, volume overload with the atrial, atrial vibration against the, or the atrial kick against the uh, overloaded ventricle, okay? Um, bibasilar crackles, a sign of congestive heart failure with the volume, with the fluid backing up into the lungs and then into the alveoli, and then the alveoli popping open when they're filled with fluid. Pitting edema, okay, another hypervolemic indication. Um, and then things you can see on lab, uric acid and BUN, both get increased um, when your sympathetic nervous system is activated, activates your uh, sodium potassium ATPase, which activates the um, increased uh, absorption of sodium, and then BUN and uric acid also come along for the ride. So these are increased in um, situations where your sympathetic is firing, which is usually hypovolemic.
but it can be others, of course, so, right, hypervolemic states, too, uh, so this is not super helpful. BNP, everybody likes BNP, now if your BNP is less than 50, uh, you will almost never have heart failure, congestive heart failure, if your BNP is less than 100, you will very rarely have congestive heart failure, uh, I'm saying these in adjectives because I forget the exact numbers. I think 97%, 90%. I'm not going to write it in there because I'm not entirely sure. But the point being, low BNP is good for ruling out heart failure. High BNP, less good for ruling in heart failure. But uh, rem And remember, the physiology behind this is that this is a hormone that is released from the ventricles when they are stretched. Um, and it, its job is to cause natriuresis, so pee out some sodium, and... Um, and uh, by that mechanism, reduce the stretch on the ventricles by reducing the volemia in your body. Uh, and then specific gravity of the urine also sometimes helpful. Notice I'm saying that none of these are 100%, right? So it all comes down to your clinical judgment, all right? And so, um, focus, focus, there we go. Clinical judgment. Uh, and so you use all this, you put it all together, and then you ask your attending what they think. And they say, well, I think the patient is hypovolemic, right? Again, our tree here, you've got three choices. Hypo, U, and hypervolemic. So, since I'm a left to right guy here, trained in America, uh, we'll start on the left. Hypovolemia. Now, one thing I want to point out here, high ADH. High ADH. High ADH. There's only one subset in euvolemia where we have low ADH. All right, everywhere else there's high ADH. Now, why would that be so? Well, we're gonna go over here to the ADH section and see. The reason is that ADH is a response to an increase in osmolality or osmolarity, whatever. Um, and uh, ADH, so. So what happens is when you it's also a response to a decrease in volume, all right? So in hypovolemic hyponatremia, the decrease in volume is driving this, the the uh, release of ADH. Now, this is before you start giggling, not what you think it is, okay? This is a pituitary, here's the anterior and the posterior pituitary. Up here would be the hypothalamus with the uh, super optic and paraventricular nuclei uh, uh, producing ADH, uh, vasopressin, in other words, and uh, oxytocin goes down the uh, neurons here and projecting from those nuclei and uh, ending right here in the posterior pituitary where ADH is stored and then released in response to an increase in osmolarity um, as sensed by the hypothalamus. Uh, osmoceptors in the hypothalamus or in a decrease in volume as sensed by baroreceptors and then uh, afferents from the vagus feedback up here. Uh, now importantly these baroreceptors can be anywhere but mostly are concentrated in the CNS and lungs. We'll come back to why that's important. Uh, so low volume of course being a stimulus saying well hey our volumes dropped so we want to hang on to more water. Osmolality saying hey we're getting dehydrated here, our salt concentration's rising, so we need to hang on to more water. Um, now, uh, ADH can also be released in, to, uh, in response to other things, but these are the number one, number two reasons to produce ADH. So ADH is released, causes the following effects on V1 receptors and V2 receptors. This occurs at a little higher concentration, so this is less important, but uh, in the V1 receptor, this is a G-protein coupled receptor that activates a GQ and causes vascular smooth muscle to contract. And then this is a nephron here, okay, Bowman's capsule, loop of Henle, distal tubule, and collecting duct here. And so the V2 receptor is on the principal cell in the collecting duct, and this is a GS, a dental cyclase. So this is a G-protein coupled receptor that stimulates a GS, activates a dental cyclase, which produces cyclic A and P, activates protein kinase A, and protein kinase A phosphorylates vesicles inside the principal cell that have aquaporin in them, and causes these vesicles to go to the luminal side of the principal cell, um, and uh, once 
aquaporin intercalates in the luminal side of the principal cell that allows water to come in through the lumen and then travel basolaterally through aquaporin 1, I think, um, basolaterally.